um, our story for today. And today we're going to be learning about a very special Sahabi. And, you know, we, if you remember last week, we talked about how, you know, the Sahaba, these are people who converted to Islam, they met the Prophet Sallallahu and they, you know, they spent their lives, the rest of their life, believing in the Prophet Sallallahu Here we're going to learn about somebody who's actually a bit of an exception to that rule. So here's what we're, so we'll, I'll, I'll leave it a little bit of a mystery. Maybe you guys will be able to figure out before I go into, before I reveal who the, the Sahabi for this week is. But we're going to start by continuing from last week. So last week, I mentioned that we were learning about, um, last week we were learning about Bilal, radiallahu anhu, right? And one of the things about Bilal, radiallahu anhu, that we learned was that he was from the land of Ethiopia, or Abyssinia. Or rather, his mother was, because he was born actually in Arabia. So one thing, you know, one thing we know about Ethiopia, one thing many of you should know is like, it's from Africa. So, you know, if you look on this map here, you see that Mecca is on one side of the sea and then Ethiopia and what's here under, it's called Aksum, that's on the other side, that's on the left side of the sea or on the Western side of the sea. So this kingdom is connected to Mecca through these various routes. You see all these red lines, these are trade routes. So back then, and even up until now, people will take ships across this Red Sea to visit the kingdom, which at the time was Christian. So people would go back and forth between Yemen, between Mecca, between all the way up to Egypt, to Ethiopia. In fact, people have been using boats to travel from all the way from Africa to Asia for centuries. You see this on the left map, that you see people going from Alexandria and Egypt all the way to China. So the main purpose for traveling back then was for business. It was through buying and selling that people got to know each other. And as some of you may know, it was actually through these routes that Islam spread to places like South India, to Malaysia, even China. Muslim traders would go far and wide and they would bring imams with them on their ships. So then many people would come from these different lands to see these people, you know, these Muslims who were coming from Arabia and from other places, and they would interact with them. And they would be so impressed by their good manners and their character that they too want to learn more about Islam. And in this way, so many people became Muslim. So many of you might have, you know, visited or heard about places like Indonesia, you know, which is on the, the south, like southeast side of Asia. You know, they came to Islam through these traders, through people coming and teaching them just because of, you know, through ships, you know, and they came and they get one of these long journeys and then the whole place became Muslim just from these small interactions. So that's something to learn is that, you know, Islam spreads through these ways that people get to know Muslims and then they learn more, then they become interested and then alhamdulillah, you know, they, they accept Islam. But at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu many people had known a lot about Abyssinia. And again, Abyssinia here, we'll say, we'll use that because that was what it was called at the time, but it's also Ethiopia now. People will refer to it as Ethiopia. It's the same region. And there's a lot of exchange between these two cultures. In fact, some of the words in the Quran are found not just in the Arabic language, which is of course the language of the Quran, but also they're in the Abyssinian language as well. So for example, there's this word mishkat, which means a small window. It's found also in the Abyssinian language. Then there's the word taha. Many of you know the surah taha. Now taha, it's the name of a surah in the Quran and it's um, just two letters, ta and ha. But in Abyssinian, taha means oh man or calling upon, you know, human being which is very interesting. That's one way to understand like, you know, this, if somebody from Abyssinia hears the Quran, he hears Taha, they might be thinking, oh, Allah is speaking to me. Allah is speaking to all of humankind. People from this land will also visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he had good reaction relations with these people. So for example, when he arrived at Medina after the Hijra, a group of people from this land, from Ethiopia, from Abyssinia performed their happiness. They were so happy that they performed this, this cultural dance. It's a war dance. So they grabbed their weapons and they'd, you know, march around and they'd, you know, really express how happy they were. And he watched 
and then invited his wife Aisha radiallahu anha to come watch as well. So these were some of the ways in which they interacted with each other. And then scholars speak of the many good traits of people from this land. They say that the Abyssinians, they have strength in body and heart, that they're brave, that they're generous, that they have good manners, that they rarely offend or insult people, that they're easygoing and charming, that they're very eloquent and have radiant smiles. That's how our tradition speaks of these noble people. And there's also in this a good lesson for us that when we visit other cultures, we should always search for the good in them so that we can learn to be better too. As Allah tells us in the Quran, he made us all into different types of people so that we can get to know each other. Not so we can fight, but so that we can learn and compete with each other in good deeds. So I encourage all of you to make friends with people from different cultures and learn about their ways and think about how you can learn from their example. And while you can play games together and have fun, you should also challenge your friends to compete in these good deeds. You know, who can do more dhikr? Who can help their family more? Who can fast more? Who can memorize more Quran? And you will find that when people compete in good, the best qualities come out. So the Prophet Sallallahu praised the people of Mecca for their leadership. He praised the people of Medina for their wisdom and judgment. He praised the people of Abyssinia for their eloquence. And he praised the people of Yemen for their sincerity. And of course, to this day, there are still Muslims in Ethiopia who still love the Prophet Sallallahu and Islam and who make beautiful music. So inshallah, what we're going to do is we're actually going to listen to a little bit of a yeshid from one of these, from Ethiopia. So you can get a sense of, you know, this is a culture from, you know, that many of us may not be familiar with. Um, and this is a great way for us to learn more and to really experience the love that these people have of the Prophet So I'm going to, inshallah, share this. We'll listen for maybe a minute. So you get a sense of, you know, how people across the world celebrate their love of the Prophet Mashallah. So again, I'm hoping that all of you, you know, enjoyed hearing this Nishi from like a very different um, culture. Mashallah. So we have, so now we Okay, Inshallah. Now let's go back to what we're talking about. We're talking again about Ethiopia. And okay, somebody's asking, is this an Abyssinian Nishi or an Ethiopian Nishi? So we call this an Ethiopian Nishi now. It's in the Amharic language, um, which also goes back. So maybe this is similar to the language they were speaking back then. Um, but you know, this is um, now the people, the kids that you're seeing, they're coming from Ethiopia now. So mashallah, the, I think this was, this was recorded in 2016. So it's very recent, but again, 
you know, these people, like people have, Muslims have been in Ethiopia since the beginning of Islam. So that's something also for us to, you know, really appreciate and reflect and, you know, really enjoy about this is how, how rich the history of the Ummah is, inshallah. Okay, so now let's go back to what we are talking about, which is about, you know, Islam in Ethiopia and the role that Ethiopia played in the um, life of the Prophet So now, many of you might know this, but the first Hijra, you know, happened to Abyssinia. So many of you know that after many years of hardship in Mecca, the Prophet وسلم, went to went with his followers to Medina. And this is called the Hijra or the migration. However, did you know that there was a Hijra before this? This Hijra happened several years before that. And as we said last week, when the Prophet وسلم, and his followers start openly practicing Islam, they were attacked and insulted by the disbelievers among the Quraysh. These people did not want anyone to be Muslim. So, and they would go so far as to attack people if they found out that they had converted. Now, some of these people, some of these early Muslims had wealth or status or some form of protection, but many of them did not. So for them, the Prophet Sallallahu wanted to ensure their protection and safety. So where did he send them? Not to other neighboring villages, not to other places in Arabia, but he sent them all the way to Abyssinia. Now, why did he do that? He did that, he did that because he knew that the people of Abyssinia had good qualities. And he also knew that there was a great king there whose name was Ashama, but who was called Najashi, which was a title for the Abyssinian king. The Prophet وسلم, told his people to go find him saying, there is a king there who does not harm the people in his land. So stay with him until Allah provides you with relief. That king was a Christian, and he was also known to be just and wise. So the Prophet وسلم, sent his people across the sea because he knew they would be safe with the ruler of good character. So a large group of Muslims went there, including the Prophet وسلم's cousin, Ja'far anhu. And they found protection with this just king, and they were able to practice their religion freely. Um Salama radiallahu anha, who at the time migrated with her husband Abu Salama radiallahu anhu, but who would later, after her husband passed away, marry the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She said this about their treatment. She said, "When we arrived in Abyssinia, we were received by the best of hosts, Al Najashi. We were safe in our religion. We worshipped Allah, and we were not harmed. Nor did anyone say anything offensive to us. So in this land." which was governed by a righteous and just Christian king, was the safest and best place for Muslims to practice their religion. And it would remain the best place for Muslims up until the Prophet وسلم, went to Medina. And of course, after that point, many people left Abyssinia to go there. So, mashallah. So then, so how many of you have heard about this, this first um, this first migration to Abyssinia. Did you know that there was a group of Sahaba, a whole group of Sahaba that the Prophet وسلم, sent all the way to Ethiopia to Abyssinia? Inshallah, let's see what people are saying in the chat. Okay, some of you have heard, some of you have, this is the first time you're learning. So, mashallah. So today, the Sahabi that we're learning about is this just king, Najashi. So we'll, let's learn more about him and let's learn about what happened. So the Muslims, they spent, you know, some time and this was great news for them. You know, they were able to go all the way and they weren't bothered anymore. But the disbelievers in Mecca, this made them even more mad. They wanted to bring the Muslims back to Mecca. They didn't like that people, that people were going and enjoying peace and freedom and all of this. So they devised a plot. They said, we're going to go all the way to Ethiopia. We're going to go talk to this king, Najashi, and tell him to stop protecting the Muslims. And you tell him to send him back, uh, to send all of the Muslims back to Mecca with us. So how did they do this? So first, they brought all of the nice things from Mecca. They brought the finest leather and the best gifts. 
and they went to Agnijashi and they gave them all gifts. So they first went to his generals and then they worked their way up. So you know, to the generals and then the commanders and then you know the advisors, all the way up to the chain of command up until they reached the king himself, Agnijashi. And they all gave them nice gifts. And they didn't say anything at this point. They just gave him nice gifts. They're like, mashallah, these are great people, you know? But they had a different idea. So the plan they had was for them to then, now that they had given these gifts, to tell Anujashi to hand the Muslims over and not give them the chance to offer their defense. So one of the Qurashi ambassadors went to the king. He said, oh, king, some people, some ignorant people have come to you from our tribe. They abandoned the religion of their forefathers. They don't follow your religion, but they made something up and it's against our beliefs and your beliefs. The elders of our tribe have sent us to ask you to give them back as they know the situation best. So they're saying all these bad things about the Muslims who are there. So the generals and the advisors around the Jashi, they're saying, you know, this sounds right. Oh, King, you know, their tribe probably, they probably know better than we do about what these people want and what their beliefs are. Maybe you should give them over. And of course they were saying this because they were just given all these nice gifts from the Quraysh. So Bagan Najashi, as we know, he's a just king. He appreciated the gifts, he was thankful for them, but he would not let that get in the way of what is right and just. So he got very angry with his generals for being so easily persuaded by nice gifts. He, he said, I will not turn anyone over just yet. These people, meaning the Muslims, these people are my guests. They chose my protection over all others and I will not dishonor them. First, I will call them and ask them about these accusations. If it turns out that these two men are telling the truth, then I'll hand the Muslims over. But if these Muslims are not as bad as these men claim, then I shall offer them my protection and hospitality for as long as they want. So he gathered all of his bishops the Christian scholars of the time and of his land. And he called for the Muslims to come and explain their beliefs. So the person who was served as a spokesperson for all of the Muslims in Ethiopia at the time was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. This was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the brother of Ali, radiallahu anhu. And Ja'far radiallahu anhu, he gave a beautiful answer that showed the truth of Islam and the fact that it came from the same source as Christianity and Judaism and all other true religions that it came from Allah. He said, Jafar radiallahu anhu said, O oh king, we used to be a people living in ignorance and evil. We used to worship idols. We used to eat dead animals. We used to do all sorts of bad and evil things. We would fight with our families. We would betray our neighbors. We would bully people around, especially the weak. And we were like this until Allah sent us a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, someone we knew to be sincere and honorable and trustworthy. And he, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, invited us to worship Allah alone and renounce idolatry. He told us to speak the truth, to keep our promises, to be good to our relatives and our neighbors, and to avoid all evil acts and to stop being violent. He told us to believe in Allah, to establish the prayer, to give in charity and to fast. So we followed his teachings and our people attacked and abused us to make us go back to worship idols instead of Allah. They oppressed us and they attacked us and they made us feel miserable and they prevented us from practicing Islam. So we sought refuge in your land, O Najashi, choosing your projection over others, hoping to live in justice and peace under your rule, O King. This was Jafar who's response Najashi radiallahu anhu, he was touched by these remarks. Who was this special man that Jafar radiallahu anhu was speaking of? Who else would have such a powerful effect on people other than a prophet of God? So Najashi's heart softened and he asked to Jafar radiallahu anhu, do you have anything with you from what Allah has revealed? Jafar radiallahu anhu said yes. And he chose to recite a passage from Surah Maryam which is about the birth of Isa alayhi salam, who of course, Al-Najashi would have believed in as a Christian king at that time. So now inshallah, I'm going to ask Brother Mustafa to recite these four or five verses from Surah Maryam so we can hear what 
you know, what uh, Jaffa radiallahu anhu recited to this Christian king. And then of course we'll have our sister Maryam give, uh, recite the English. So inshallah Mustafa, whenever you're ready. Okay, child, and now we're here from Maria, who will recite the English. She pointed to the baby. They exclaimed, how can we talk to someone who is an infant in the cradle? Isa declared, I am truly a servant of Allah. He said, destined me, he said, he has destined me to be given the, the scripture to, and to be a prophet. He has made me a blessing wherever I go and bid me to establish prayer and give charity as long as I live and to be kind to my mother. He has not made me arrogant or defiant. Peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I will be raised back to life. That is Jesus, son of Mary, a word of truth about which they dispute. MashaAllah, So <clears throat> these were the verses, you know, telling us about the, the special status of Isa, of Jesus, alayhi salam, in Islam, coming directly from Allah, coming directly from, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu and now being recited by Ja'far, radiallahu anhu. So, Najashi, radiallahu anhu, he hears these beautiful verses, and all of, and him, and all of the bishops, all of the Christian scholars around him, they started crying, such that their beards and the scriptures they were holding, the books they were holding, they all got wet from their tears. An Najashi who said, Verily, this book and the book that Isa salam came with are from the same place. He then told the men from the Quraysh to leave, saying, By Allah, I will never hand these Muslims over to you. Before they left, the men of the Quraysh came back to An Najashi and they said, But 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 no, no, these Muslims, they don't respect you know Isa salam like you do. You know, they they don't, you know, you're getting the wrong story. So Najashi radiallahu anhu, he called Jafar radiallahu anhu back. He said, okay, explain to me what Muslims believe about Isa alayhi salam. And Jafar radiallahu anhu explained that Isa alayhi salam is a prophet and he's a servant of Allah who placed him into the womb of his mother, Mary alayhi salam. And Najashi radiallahu anhu, he then picked up a short stick from the ground and he proclaimed the difference between our beliefs about Isa alayhi salam and their beliefs about Isa alayhi salam is no longer than this stick. Go, go, you, you are safe to be in my land. And the ones who are against you, they will be punished by Allah. So he told his generals to return all these nice gifts to the men from the Quraysh and to send them back on their way. Now, as you remember, this whole story was narrated by one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Um Salama. She said 
She then completes her story by saying that the Muslims lived in peace under Najashi Radilawanghu until for many years, until they returned to be with the Prophet وسلم, after the Hijra to Medina, after the situation with the Quraysh improved. Now, we had seen that Najashi Radilawanghu is was so taken by the Quran. So what happens? He spent so much time with Muslims that this righteous Ethiopian Abyssinian king, he fell in love with the Prophet and he fell in love with Islam. He was convinced that this was the same message that Isa brought. He wished to have a connection with the Prophet but sadly they were so far apart. But the Prophet he knew of this longing. So one day he sent a formal invitation to Najashi Radiallahu inviting him to Islam. He sent this letter and Najashi Radiallahu again, you can see just how much love he had for, again, the Prophet Sallallahu he never met him. He just knew from the Quran that he heard and from the people that he had met, the Muslims that he had met, he was humbled and excited to be receiving a letter from the Prophet Sallallahu He even took the letter when he got the envelope, he placed it on his face and eyes just to have that feeling of it on his face, to feel that closeness to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, thinking, you know, the, the blessed, the, these are the blessed works of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that are coming to me. And he humbled himself. He got off his throne and he sat on the ground. He didn't want to read the works of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while sitting on this high lofty throne. He wanted to be humble, just like every other, everybody else. You know, he sat on the ground and then he read this, the letter in a state of modesty, submission, and reverence. And in this letter, the Prophet Sallallahu said that he testified that Isa was a prophet of Allah. And he invited Anjashi to follow the new revelation, the new worship that, that the idea that you should worship Allah only without any partners, without anyone in between. And that if you wanted, he could learn more about the religion from Jafar, radiallahu anhu. So Anjashi responded immediately with his own letter, saying that what the Prophet وسلم, said about Isa السلام, is the truth, and that he was learning from Jafar. And then he testified his belief that there is only one Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his messenger. So he came to Islam and he testified. He said that if he could, he would go immediately to go see the Prophet وسلم, and even ask in the letter if he if he, she should go. But he was a king and he had an obligation to his people. He was not able to go. Instead, he sent his son and 60 other people to go visit the Prophet وسلم, but subhanAllah, their ship sank and they gave their lives in the path of Islam. But of course, Najashi radiallahu anhu maintained his respect for Christianity. His kingdom was still mostly Christian and he loved Isa السلام, but he also loved the Prophet وسلم, but he didn't tolerate any disrespect or other people's faiths. So one time he heard a Muslim laugh at someone reciting the Bible and he got angry and he said, are you laughing at one of the books of Allah? So just as he protected Muslims from ridicule, he also protected the Christians as well. This was the justice and the balance of Najashi. But even though he could not go to see the Prophet وسلم, in person, Ayn Najashi who did his best to maintain this relationship with the Prophet. He continued to host Muslims in his land for as long as they wanted. And he sent many gifts to the Prophet وسلم. He sent them a pair, he sent him a pair of fine leather socks, khufs. The Prophet وسلم, loved these socks so much, he would wear them often, and then he would wipe over them when he did wudu. He also, Najashi Radiallahu also sent some expensive jewelry to the Prophet وسلم, including a fancy gold ring with a gemstone from the land, from Ethiopia. The Prophet وسلم, gifted it to his granddaughter, Umama Radiallahu Anhu, telling her, wear this, O oh my daughter. And when the Prophet وسلم, wanted to marry a woman who was there in, in Ethiopia, he asked Najashi Radiallahu Anhu to propose on his behalf. So this woman was Um Habiba Radiallahu Anha. She had migrated to Abyssinia, but she had problems with her husband at the time because he didn't want to be Muslim. And after he died, she actually saw her husband in a dream. And he referred to her as a mother of the believers. 
And being a mother of the believers means that you were a wife of the Prophet Sallallahu So she understood from this dream that Allah was telling her that she was going to marry the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she did actually marry the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while she was still in Abyssinia, while she was still in Ethiopia. And Najashi anhu was chosen by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be his representative in the marriage proceedings. And then Najashi anhu threw a feast for everyone to celebrate the marriage. And then he gave Um Habiba radiallahu anha some provisions and a convoy to help her go back to be with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina. That's how generous and and close he was with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Even though, again, they never met. They just knew about each other through these letters, through these through these connections. And then, of course, this was the legacy of the just king. And Najashi who stood firm on the truth, he protected the Muslims and he loved Allah and the Prophet. He passed away in the month of Rajab. And remember, we were talking about Rajab at the beginning of this lesson. So this is the special month that we're in. In the ninth year of and in the ninth year of the Hijrah, in this month of Rajab, that was when Najashi who passed away. And when he heard about the passing of Najashi radiallahu anhu, the Prophet وسلم, held a janazah prayer for him in Medina. He told everyone, pray for the forgiveness of your brother who has died in another land. And his companions were saying, oh, who is this person? Who is this person that has died? We don't know, we, we don't see him. And the Prophet وسلم, said, it is Najashi. So the Prophet وسلم, counted Najashi radiallahu anhu as one of his closest companions and he prayed for him, even though they never met in person. And Aisha radiallahu anha said that when An-Najashi radiallahu anhu was buried, that light emanated from his grave, that there would be light coming from his grave. May Allah bless An-Najashi radiallahu anhu. So before we close, let us mention some of the lessons that we learned from the story of An-Najashi radiallahu anhu. The first is that it shows the strong ties between Muslims and Christians, and also between Arabs and Africans. That from the beginning of the religion, Muslims lived in love and harmony with people of other religions and other lands, and they united upon goodness and justice. But from Najashi radiallahu anhu himself, you learn so many beautiful qualities. We learn about his sincerity and love for the truth, that once he heard and understood the beauty and love of Islam, he accepted it, and he loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and had this close relationship with the prophets, even though they never met in person. The second is his hospitality and generosity. He gladly and proudly hosted and protected the Muslims as refugees when no one else would take them in. The third is his commitment to justice. When some disbelievers from the Quraysh came and tried to bribe him in exchange for hanging over Muslims, he refused and gave the Muslims a chance to defend themselves. And these are all big lessons for us. It is because of his character, Najashi radiallahu anhu became close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa such that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prayed for him even when he died in a distant land. They were close even though they were far away from each other and never met in person and didn't have the same cultural background or language. So this applies to us too. We may not know the language or culture, we may, we might not, you know, know Arabic, we might not be close to Arabia, we might not be living near Mecca. But if we love Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we will inshallah also have that closeness to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we have the character that Najashi had, we will inshallah have the same type of, ha, same type of relationship where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will pray for us just like he prayed for Najashi when we need it most. So may Allah bless Najashi radiallahu anhu and allow us to learn from his example. May Allah bless the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and allow us to learn from his example. Inshallah, jazakum khair. So inshallah, we'll close with some dua. A'udhu bina min shaitan rasheem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbin alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki Yom Eddin, Iyaka Nabudu wa Iyaka Nastain, Ehdena Sirot al Mustaqim, Sirot al Nadin and Amtarehim, Rayr Mahdubi Alehim Muradin, Amin. Allah, we ask you to help us improve our character and to become more beloved to you and to learn more about the companions and to 
show the best of qualities of all of the companions, me, radiallahu anhum, and that we become like, like them, stars in the sky, bright lights on this world, on this earth, and legends that will help ourselves and our families and the future generations of Muslims, inshallah. O Allah, we ask you to help us become close to the Prophet وسلم, just like Najashi was, radiallahu anhu, and to be brave and just and hospitable and generous and kind and fair and sincere like Najashi radiallahu anhu. And we ask as always that you send the best of your blessings upon the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yisalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim. Subhana rabbika rabbi rizzati amma yisifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bi rahmatika ya arhamu rahimeen.